humans learn by making mistakes. You know, you play golf. I'm sure Tiger Woods has hit more bad shots than me. <laughs> He's failed more than me. So when you look at the real reality of the world, the biggest failures are the most successful. They failed their way to success. 401ks, the American dollar, even the stock market do not provide actual wealth, says Robert Kiyosaki. So let's dig into the idea of financial success in this episode. Robert is the best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, a now iconic book on growing up faced with two opposing mentalities toward money that's still on the charts and still acclaimed today 25 years later. Our economic landscape is dramatically changing, including a new recession, cryptocurrency, and an education system not only neglecting students on finance, but now going as far as turning young people against capitalism and the values of free markets themselves. So, how does rich dad philosophy apply in the year 2022? On current federal policy, Robert references the Communist Manifesto, beliefs that were well regarded in his childhood home by his biological dad, his poor dad. His newest book is a response. Capitalist Manifesto, the latest in more than 25 finance books Robert has published. In our episode, Robert tells us about discovering business and capitalism as a young boy, the difference between good debt and bad debt, and how the Biden administration compares to that of his longtime friend and frequent collaborator, former President Trump. Hey, hey, and welcome. This is the Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special. This show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. It's time to stand up against big tech. Protect your data at expressvpn.com slash Ben. Just a reminder, we'll be doing some bonus questions at the end with Robert Kiyosaki. The only way to get access to that part of the conversation is to become a member. Head on over to dailywire.com slash Sunday. You can click that link in the episode description and use code Ben for 25% off. You'll have access to all of the full conversations with every one of our awesome guests, Robert, thanks so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. My honor. I have watched you for years, and uh, congratulations on all your success. Hey, thank you so much. And so, you, you're a very controversial young man. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it pays the bills. So, so you know, you are, I first encountered your work the same way pretty much everybody did with Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Right. Uh, so uh, the, the main question to start with is, how do you become a financial guru? How do you get into like the financial guru business? What, what is the career path that takes you there? Well, it's the same way you became successful. You just go against the grain. You know, everything my school taught me to do, I go to school, get a job, work hard, save money, get out of debt and invest the, for the long, in the long term in IRA or 401k, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs. I don't do. Okay. So <laughs> how, do you, how do you come to those conclusions? Because, I mean, the truth is for a lot of people, that's not horrible advice. I mean, you, 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 can, you can do okay that way. You'll never become immensely billionaire wealthy that way. But a lot of people lead a pretty oh, solid could. upper middle class lifestyle that way. You could. But that was a story of rich dad, poor dad. See, my poor dad was one of these guys where PhD, went to Stanford, University of Chicago, Northwestern. But he was poor. I, I, used, to, I used to tell him when I was a kid, PhD stood for poor, helpless, and broke. You know, <laughs> desperate, desperate. And my rich dad was a man who never went to school. So his mind wasn't affected by academics. And so when it came to the subject of money, you know, he thought differently. So having both men as teachers and mentors, I could see both sides of their worlds. And as I grew older, I liked what my rich dad was saying because he was an entrepreneur. My poor dad was an employee. Go to school, get a job and steady paycheck, job security. It didn't make me happy, you know, so I went to become an entrepreneur. See, in 1971, when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, right? Violated, broke, you know, just broke all the rules. And my poor dad kept saying, save money. Well, why would you save money when they can print it? You know what I mean? Why would you do that? So I came back, I went to Vietnam twice as a Marine pilot. And I came back and I couldn't listen to my poor dad anymore. He wanted me to become, you know, fly for United Airlines and get a job in a 401k and, or I don't know that United Airlines pensions are gone. You know, they got looted. Mm -hmm. You know, so I couldn't listen to my poor dad anymore. But this is in 1970, 74. And in 74 was when ERISA was passed. ERISA was uh, Economic Income Re Retirement Security Act. And anything the government says are going to protect, you know, you're in trouble. <laughs> so I'm just like you. I'm going, what are they pulling here? that ERISA became the 401k. Mm. And what happened then, so this is 1974, I'm just getting out of the Marine Corps. You know, my father wants me to go fly for United or Hawaiian. And I go, I don't think I want to do that. I feel set up. 
So I'm just like you. I just didn't trust the sons of a bitches. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And then I noticed all these school teachers leaving the school system to become financial planners. And the more I saw that, I went, oh my God, they're being set up. So I am just like you. I go, why are they doing this? And so when I saw my father's compadres, you know, all these school teachers with master's degrees, PhDs, becoming financial planners, they were treading into my rich dad's territory. And I got more sus suspicious. So I, my rich dad finally says, you know, school teachers becoming financial planners. I like the poor leading the blind. <laughs> 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 I am just like you. I, I think a little deeper. Behind. I want to know what's really going on behind the scenes. So do you think that, you know, what sort of attitude people adopt is more instinct or do you think that it, it can be bred? In other words, can, can people change what they are? As, as some people I know are just more risk-seeking by nature. They, they look at the world and they feel like the, the drive to go out and take a risk. And some people just don't feel comfortable doing that. They feel like they want to receive yes. the salary. They want to just put their money right. here, let it sit there for 20 years. They, they, they don't want the kind of hurly-burly. Do you think that's an attitudinal thing that, that is natural to people? Or do you think that you can train yourself to become more risk-seeking over time? I, that's a tough question. I, I more agree with you. You kind of inherently know it. And I just, I just went out, you know, I went to two tours in Vietnam as a gunship pilot. And I read the Communist Manifesto in 1965. And everybody should read that book because you can see it happening here today. And so in 1965, read the Communist Manifesto. 66, I'm in Vietnam for my first time. Went back in 72 and I could see communism spreading. So I become cynical. So I don't know if it's curious what it is. I just became cynical and distrusting of my own government and schools, and teachers, you know, and Wall Street. But I said, I think I'll start questioning everything. So in a second, I want to ask you, you know, what that sort of led you to in terms of your own investment strategy. First, let's talk about making sure that your online activity is safe from prying eyes. I'm sure you've heard me talk about Biden's infrastructure bill. Congress passed it last year. Here's something you probably didn't know about it. In a few years, every single car might be required to come with a safety device that passively monitors you for impaired driving. I don't know about you, I'm not sure the government needs to know what's happening in my car at all times. Why exactly is that their business? Big government would like to control every part of your life and clamp down on your digital freedom, which is why I use ExpressVPN to protect my network from being monitored. See, your internet provider can keep logs of your internet activity. This includes stuff like the sites you visited and how much time you spent on them. But when you use ExpressVPN, your internet activity is shielded. Their app works by rerouting 100% of your network data through their secure encrypted servers to keep your activity private. Unlike the kill switch the government wants to put in all of our cars, ExpressVPN's kill switch actually protects you. If your VPN connection ever drops, network data is immediately stopped from entering or leaving your device to keep your privacy from being compromised. It's a kill switch that actually you control. And all it takes is one easy tap of a button for ExpressVPN to secure all of your devices. It's just that simple. So stop letting the government spy on you. Take back your privacy and freedom at expressvpn.com slash Ben. Get three extra months for free. That's expressvpn.com slash Ben. Get this special offer for my listeners, expressvpn.com slash Ben. So let's talk about what this sort of realization that, that a lot of these institutions were not telling the truth, that many of them were setting up, what this sort of led you to. What was your new strategy for how to address the world and, and get involved in the economy? Well, I, I, I'm a student of Dr. R. Buckminster Fuller, you know, from Harvard. And Harvard claims he is a graduate, but Fuller never graduated from Harvard. Got kicked out twice for behavioral problems, <laughs> as we understand. And Fuller was my teacher, and uh, he's considered one of the greatest greatest futurists. But he said all coins have three sides: heads, tails, and the edge. And he says intelligence is found the edge. And so what you do and what I do is we look at both sides. Then we decide what's and it's, it's good and bad on both sides. But we have to look at both sides. And most people want to look at one side. Like this is one guy says that the problem with Americans are we're dysfunctional optimists. You know, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. that's Americans. And we're being raped, robbed, and stolen. Our freedoms have been taken away. Do, do you know what I mean? So you and I are very similar. I go, why are they doing this? Why are we letting them do this? That's what gets to me. And my specialty is not politics, but, but money the financial systems, the Fed. You know, people say, well, don't fight the Fed. Well, who told you that? Why not fight those bastards? You know what I mean? 
I mean, can the Fed print oil? Can they print food? Can they print water? No, they print that fake stuff called the U.S. dollar. So that's why I'm suspicious all the time. So when you talk about sort of your own investment strategy, you, you say that the stock market is inflated, that the dollar is not a good source of value, that bonds are going to get paid back in inflated dollars. So where do you recommend that people put their money? Just like you, I do the opposite. I'm 100% debt. You see, in 71, when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard breaking, the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement, he just broke the, he just screwed the whole world. The dollar became credit, debt. So we hold up a credit card. Is there any money in it? No. All credit is, is the agreement to pay it back. That's all it is. So at that point, after, when I, and so that was 71. So 72, I'm flying in Vietnam. And I said, what is the gold standard? I didn't know what it was. In 72, it was illegal for Americans to own gold. And I went, that's interesting. But they don't teach that in school. You know, so I went shopping for gold in Vietnam. <laughs> the trouble was, it was behind enemy lines. You know, the NVA, the North Vietnamese, had overrun the gold mine. And marine pilots are not the brightest guys in the box. You know what I mean? <laughs> so my, my co-pilot and I, we, we create this partnership. So we're going to fly behind enemy lines and we're going to buy gold. So we got there. We had this gold mine. We, we took all our guns off. We walked through the village saying, we come as capitalists. We're not Marines. You know, we're unarmed. I just want to buy gold. And the two of us were college graduates, academy graduates. We walk up and we don't even know what gold is. You know? mm -hmm. And this little Vietnamese woman there, bright red teeth, because they eat beetle nuts. And, I, and gold had floated from 35 to 50 that day. And so I offered her 40. And <laughs> she went, and she goes, spot. I go, what is spot? I said, I'll give you a fort. Spot. I'm going, what the hell is she talking? I was getting educated. Gold is money. The mm -hmm. Fed cannot print it. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I became more cynical. So you, I own gold mines now. <laughs> yeah, so, so you, you recommend people investing in hard assets that can't be manipulated by the government? I don't recommend anything. I recommend study. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Be a student of whatever you're... But most people haven't read the Communist Manifesto yet. Do you know what I mean? You should start with that. You know, it was, it was Marx who said a graduated income tax is essential for the spread of communism. Then you have AOC, you know, I think she's one of your favorites. <laughs> and she says, tax the rich. I go, she's hardcore Marxists as they come. Do you know what I mean? But we don't know. And then if you look at taxes, America was founded as a tax-free nation. 1773 was a thing called the Boston Tea Party. And now we're taxing everything. But that could only happen because the gold, I mean, the dollar became credit. And the only way you can pay that credit back is via taxes. And so today, America is the largest debtor nation in the world. Our debt to GDP is like 125. 90 were bankrupt, 125. And, they, and, and you know, Powell, the Fed chairman, says we're going to raise rates. He does that, he'll kill us. They know that. But we still go to school, get a job, and learn nothing about money. Yeah, I mean, they, they, there is obviously, when it comes to America's sort of fiscal sanity, no, nothing there. I mean, they, they, they don't, they're not thinking long term. Everything seems moment to moment. And yet we're told that we're supposed to grant extraordinary levels of authority to these people behind closed doors who are going to fix the economy. Uh, it was reported this week, actually, that uh, Joe Biden is now going to extend the, the authority of the Federal Reserve. No, before, they were tasked with, extend, with uh, keeping inflation under control, which they've done a stellar job. And uh, they were tasked with keeping unemployment low. And they've now been tasked with achieving racial equity. Uh, so giving, giving them more authority, given their excellent and stellar track record to, to achieve racial equity. And th this is precisely the opposite of the sort of free markets that, that you require in order to succeed. Communism. That's all I can say. The Fed is Marxist. Central bank. If you understand, when you look at the macro, macro of the economy, the central bank or central control of the economy is the primary reason for Marx. You know, he says the abolition of private property. And that's why, so who's that other character? Klaus Schwab says, someday you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. It's seeping into us every day via academics. 
So if you read the Communist Manifesto, it started to come true because what Marx says, uh, communism would come into America in two stages. So stage one was 1930. It's when the Frankfurt School sent teachers to Columbia University's Teachers College. So that was 1930. That was stage one. So they had to infect us via academics. That's why there's no financial education in schools. Stage two was a 2020 election. You know, this is, as Stalin said, it's not who votes that counts. It's who counts the votes. So let's talk about President Trump. You, you obviously have a very warm relationship with President Trump. You co-authored a couple of books with, with President Trump. So, you know, the, the widespread perception of President Trump is that he is a man without a plan uh, and that he, and that he uh, is sort of, you know, bouncing around, doing what he wills at any particular moment. You know him pretty well, obviously. For, how did you get involved with President Trump in the first place? Well, like, um, we used to speak at these large real estate if, if convent. I'm, I'm not political. Do you know what I mean? I vote for the person. I, I, I've done that, but I've now had to become political, if you know what I mean. I was kind of forced. My friend here, Kenny Mac- McElroy and I, we, we do debt financing. We, use, we borrow our asses off. We're a billion dollars in debt. So so was Trump. <laughs> and, and we became good friends. We sit in the green room, you know, and he goes, he goes, who are you? I said, I wrote a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad. He goes, ah, oh, bullshit, you know. <laughs> and I think the reason I love that man, there's no two Donald Trumps. I mean, there's one guy, what you see. That is true. Is what you get. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. But he's got no problem being Donald Trump. And my respect for him went up. And so as the years went on, I wrote two books with him, and his two sons are about your age, you know, Don Jr. and Eric. They're brilliant young men. Their daughter, Ivanka, oh my God, they're hardcore capitalists. And I have tremendous respect, and that's what their father and mother taught them. So that's why, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is what I say is that we have to teach capitalism at home because we're teaching communism in schools. So let's talk about debt for a second. So there's a widespread perception uh, on the part of many on the right that that taking out debt in order to finance X, Y, or Z is a bad idea. That that in order to, you know, achieve your financial goals in the future, the first thing is to get out of debt. I mean, this is like a a whole school of thought on the right. And for many people who, you know, I I know a lot of people who've had credit card trouble, who have gotten themselves in real trouble with debt. What, What you've advocated with regard to debt for entrepreneurs, though, Obviously, there's there's truth to that. The vast majority of companies start with somebody actually having to take out a loan against something in order to, in order to get a, a company started. So how do, how do you recommend that people draw that balance between you know, working off of debt uh, and also not getting themselves in so much trouble that it destroys them? Well, there's two kinds of debt. Now, this is basic financial education or financial literacy, they call it. There's good debt and bad debt. Good debt is debt that somebody else pays off for you. So when I buy an apartment house with my friend Kenny, I don't pay for it. The bank lends us the money and debt is tax-free, right? So let's say we put a billion dollars down to buy a $5 million apartment house. So we now have a a, a $5 million asset and our tenants pay for that. That's good debt. But I take out my credit card to go eat sushi. That's bad debt because I got to pay for it. And it's that simple. So, you know, like when people talk to their children and they say, look, is that good debt or bad debt? And it forces them to think discernly. Like I, every time I watch you when you're debating somebody, I feel for them because you surgically remove everything. <laughs> you are surgically vicious. <laughs> I love it. I sit there laughing my ass off. <laughs> but you see what, what postmodernist education is, is opinion driven by emotion. And when they debate you, you use facts. And it's tough to argue with you because you use facts, they use opinions driven by their emotions. It's postmodernist education taught our schools today. So in a second, I want to ask you about Joe Biden's economic policies versus Trump's economic policies. And you say that you weren't political, but you've sort of been forced to be, become political. First, let's talk about your investment portfolio. Well, in case you missed it, last month, Treasury Secretary Johnny Yellen openly admitted to having completely blown it when it came to inflation. This human, who is supposed to be the authority on our nation's economic policy, by the way, said, quote, I was wrong about the path inflation would take. There have been unanticipated and large shocks to the economy that have boosted energy and food prices and supply bottlenecks that have affected our economy badly that at the time I didn't fully understand, unquote. Well, there you have it. 
straight from the Proudfoot's mouth. It goes without saying that you can't trust these so-called authorities on economic policy, which is why you should probably invest at least some of your money in gold and silver with Birch Gold Group. Protect your savings from a highly turbulent economy by diversifying your 401k or IRA into physical gold. It's not too late for you to take action right now. Text Ben to 989898. Get a free information kit on diversifying and protecting your savings with precious metals. Birch Gold Group has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, countless five-star reviews, thousands of satisfied customers. Text Ben to 989898. Get real advice from Birch Gold today. Again, text Ben to 989898 to claim your free no-obligation info kit on protecting your savings of gold. Okay, so let's talk about the, the differences that have kind of cropped up over time. You, you say that you weren't particularly political. Now you found yourself in a position of having to be political. So first of all, what made you have to be political? What, what was that big shift for you? When I realized that what, uh, like I said, in 1965, I was, I was living in Hawaii. I was a terrible student, but I got nomination to Naval Academy, Merchant Marine Academy, and Army. And so I went to military school. And in military school, the economics we studied was Marx and Stalin, and Mao, and Hitler. And in the military, when you study, know thy enemy. And so I knew Marx probably very well. I knew Stalin fairly well. Mao, I didn't understand. Probably because it's Chinese and I'm Asian. <laughs> but, anyway, you know. but when I start, when you have information in your head to think critically, you can see it. But as long as Americans are the, you know, dysfunctionally optimistic, don't worry, be happy. They can't see anything. So when, when I see AOC stand up there and say tax the rich, that's 100% marks. You've talked about the national debt. You said the national debt is, is a real problem. I mean, to a certain extent, isn't the national debt having, I mean, you see why the government's taking out the debt. I mean, for, for the government, that's their apartment building. I mean, they, we pay it off, right? They don't pay it off. All the politicians get to take debt from us, and then they get to spend it on whatever they want. And then we're the ones who pay it off. So you see why actually both parties have engaged in massive spending boondoggles. I mean, I voted for President Trump in 2020. I supported him in 2020. But the amount of spending that the United States government did under President Trump was exorbitant. And, uh, and then, of course, that's been doubled down on by, by President Biden. Uh, do you think that there, it, what, what would it take for the U.S. government to rein in the spending? Or do you think that it's just going to come crashing down as a matter of course? Because as you point out, the minute they start raising the interest rates, they're going to have to pay back a lot of that debt at, at, at higher rates that's just unsustainable. Yeah, like I said, all coins have three sides, heads, tails, and the edge. And as a free individual, we stand on the edge looking at both sides. Do I think they can pay off that debt? Personally, no. So the question is not what the government's going to do about that. What am I going to do about that? Because I'm not going to change the government. You know what I mean? It's so corrupt, as you know. I own gold, gold mines and silver mines. I invest in cattle, water, oil. Everything the Fed cannot print, I'll invest in. <laughs> but that's my philosophy. I don't recommend what I do because I'm a billion dollars in debt. Mm -hmm. But debt is money. <laughs> so but the government uses it through pork barrel stuff and the social welfare and all these stupid programs. That's why I pay zero taxes also, legally. And I can do that because I understand macroeconomics and finance. So what do you think about investing in the stock market? So, you, you for example, credit was extraordinarily loose until the last five right. minutes or so. Uh, and people were basically arbitraging the credit. They were, they were taking out money from the bank right. and then they were investing it in the stock market. You get this massive stock market bubble in which the PE values are completely out of whack. The, the, the price to equity value is wildly, wildly insane. Uh, and, um, and so you can see why people are doing that. I mean, the, the debt at that point is free and the stock market is increasing. But the problem is that in, in pretty much every area, when doesn't that create bubbles? Well, what, what's the limit to that? In yeah, I mean, I, well, you're exactly correct. But then there's good debt and bad debt. I'm not going to change. You know, the CEOs were borrowing money to buy back their own stock. They couldn't grow their companies, so they just jack up the stock price. And all the baby boomers like me get all happy and all this stuff. You know, don't worry, be happy. And, the, and we finance our social problems with debt. They'll never be paid back. So that's what I think about. So why don't I invest in the stock market? Because I don't have to. Let me say it again. The Fed cannot print oil. <laughs> I own oil wells. I don't own oil stocks. Mm -hmm. they, can't, they can't print cattle. So I own cattle and I breed cattle. You know, I do. I, they can't print real estate. So I borrow the printed money to buy real estate and my tenants pay it off. 
And because I use borrowed money, which is tax-free, and my tenants pay off my asset, I'm allowed to depreciate it, amortize it, and uh, what's one more thing? Appreciation. Appreciation. Mm -hmm. All of it's tax-free. America is a tax-free nation, but you have to be a capitalist. And that's why there's no financial education in our schools, because academics are primarily socialist Marxists. So given that fact, what do you think the future of the country looks like? I mean, right now, one of the things that I think a lot of people are optimistic about, if you're on the right, is that there's a wild level of institutional distrust that's now taking place. So the kind of institutional distrust that you're talking about experiencing in the 60s and 70s, looking at, at what Nixon is doing, taking us off Bretton Woods, that uh, that didn't sink in for a lot of people. For, for several decades, there's been sort of a baseline level of trust in our institutions. And since the 2007-2008 crisis, it's really cratered. And particularly since 2016, it's completely cratered with the, with the realization that, that so much of our financial system uh, is controlled by people who really are not fans of capitalism, uh, with the realization that so many of the institutions of law enforcement are controlled by people who have a political agenda. You know, that, that could be a good thing. It could also be a really bad thing because you, you see sort of society bifurcating. On, on the one hand, you have people who are on the right saying these institutions are bad. They need to have their power curbed. We need more individual freedom. On the other hand, you have people on the left who are saying, these institutions are bad. They should be given more power to control the people I don't like, and then maybe they'll be good. Well, there was a book by Anne Rand called Atlas Shrugged, and I read that book. Which is, where, did, where did they go into hiding? And so I, I already bought my hiding place. <laughs> and I, I, and again, I don't tell people what to do because I can do what I do, but I study hard to do it. You know, that's like a doctor studies hard to be a doctor. It doesn't mean you should be a doctor yourself. But there's five things called the five Gs. Number one is gold, grub for food. That's why I invest in cattle, ground, real estate, gasoline. I don't invest in, I used to work for Standard Oil, but I don't invest in oil stocks. I invest in the oil on the ground and then guns, <laughs> the five Gs. <laughs> And, and that's what I basically say to people. And then I'm considered one of these right-wing wackos. But I also have a private island where armed guards and uh, defensible uh, marine, defensible positions. I use full automatic weapons. I don't use Glocks. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know how education can screw you up? Well, it screwed me up being a marine and going to military school <laughs> because I saw the dark side. I'm going... You know, I, I don't live in the don't worry, be happy world. You know, I want to see all heads and tails, light and dark. So in a second, I want to ask you sort of how you think, I'm very critical of the educational system, how you think kids should be educated? How do they learn about this stuff properly? Is it sort of life experience or are there actual lessons that, that are easy to inculcate? We'll get to that in a second. First, let's talk about your sleep quality. So here's the thing. My kids keep me up like all the time. If I did not have a Helix sleep mattress, I would be about as brain dead as our current president. Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete, matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for somebody else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress you know will be perfect for the way you sleep. Everybody is unique. Helix knows that. They have several different mattress models to choose from. They have soft, medium, and firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. Even a Helix Plus mattress for plus-sized folks. I love my Helix Sleep mattress. Again, it was made just for me. It is firm. It is breathable. And that is what I need. If you're looking for a mattress, you take the quiz, order the mattress you're matched to. The mattress comes right to your door, shipped for free. You don't ever need to go to a mattress store again. Helix is great, but you don't need to take my word for it. Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. So head on over to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Take that two-minute sleep quiz. They'll match you to a customized mattress that'll give you the best sleep of your life. Plus, 10-year warranty. You can try it out for 100 nights risk-free. So exactly what do you have to lose? The answer, of course, is nothing. For a limited time, Helix is offering up to 350 bucks off all mattress orders, plus two free pillows for our listeners. That's their best offer yet. Hurry on over to helixsleep.com slash Ben. All right, so let's talk about the educational system. Obviously, the educational system, they don't even teach basic econ. I mean, not econ 101. It, it, it seems like most of the education you get about economics is rooted in what do we think is fair? You know, we're in a room and we have a pile of money. How should we distribute the money? There's always this assumption that there's a pile of money to begin with and that somebody has produced it and now we get to control it. But, you know, they, it's, it's notoriously difficult to teach people not only basic econ, but, but also just how to make good financial decisions, especially unless you're using simple rubrics like don't take out debt. Because, again, good debt versus bad debt is a more subtle distinction than, than no debt. So how, what, what's the best way? You have a, a kid who's five, six, seven years old. You're, you want to create an educational program for them that's going to lead to them being a very successful entrepreneur someday. How do you start that process? 
Okay, but that's why I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, like you're a parent. You're the child's most important teacher. And that's what I say. But if you're an idiot and you're broke and, and you know you can't pay off your credit card debt, what are you teaching your kids? So that's why my wife and I created the cash flow board game, you know, to teach income expense, asset li- liabilities, cash flow. But the financial statement, people may not know this, is really blockchain. So when they talk about blockchain today, when you look at a financial statement, it's income, expense, asset liability, statement of cash flow, auditor. In the real world of crypto, the auditor is blockchain. You've got to verify your numbers. Trust, but verify. So that's why in 1996, my wife and I created the cash flow board game because as Maria Montessori said, what the hand does, the mind remembers. What that means is you can't become a golfer reading a book. You know, you got to pick up this club and hit bad balls and all that. But our schools punish you for making mistakes. So if I get up there and hit a bad shot, they'll say, oh, you're a stupid golfer. Well, no, take more lessons. And, and that's as the most important thing for the parent is to be the child's most important financial educator. But if the parent is an idiot or is broke, you know what I mean? You can't control their spending. That affects the child. So the parent is the child's most important teacher. So that's why I created board games and write books to stay away from the school system. Education is important, but be careful what you're being taught. You know, Thomas Sowell, he's a fantastic human being, Marine also. You know, he says, he says school is now indoctrination. It's not education. I mean, I've talked about this with my wife because my kids are still very young. They're eight, six, and two. And so we've talked about the possibility of what to do when the kids get to college age. And what what I've said to her before is, unless they're doing something in STEM, right, where you actually have to have classes in order to become a doctor or become an engineer, if they're looking at liberal arts or if they're just looking at business, I'd rather take all the money that we're talking about and just give it to them to start a business. And I'd rather they try and fail and lose all the money and learn the lessons of failing then go to school and learn how to fail per- perennially and forever because it seems like that that's mostly what, what is being taught at the college level. The, the, the number of entrepreneurs who are people who never went to college, it seems like is really disproportionate Less to the number of people who went to college. Or The expectations are wildly out of, out of context from, from where people end up. I mean, I look at my own company and my own company, you know, I'm a law school educated guy. My two business partners, neither of them finished college. One of them didn't even go. And so you know, those are people who started off working with their, one of them started off working with his hand and literally handling the gardening on an estate. And another one of them ended up that when I met him, he was volunteering for a 501c3 group making zero dollars a year. And the way he learned business was actually doing the business. And we had to try a couple of times before we actually succeeded in building Daily Wire. I don't think there's necessarily a substitute for that. And we, we don't give our kids enough chance to take the risk and then fail. Yeah, but you said it accurately. You're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. You better go to school. Of course. I, I, I want to be a, a pilot. It's best I have a good instructor and <laughs> who can fly the plane so I can learn to fly the plane. So I say to parents, you know, choose your teachers wisely. But today, I mean, Biden and all those guys are calling parents terrorists. How far down is education gone? How can the teachers allow that to happen? How can they teach, teach critical race theory saying that America is a systemically racist country. That's a racist remark. You know, and I'm Japanese-American, a fourth generation. My family was locked up in concentration camps in California. We had all of our property taken and all this stuff. But America is not systemically racist. There are racists here, obviously. But the, the most of them are in school today. And they're not... So I say to parents, you know, what are you teaching your kids when it comes to money? And then who are, what are your schools teaching your kids about money? And for most people, it's zero. So how old are your kids now? Uh, they are eight, six, and two. Okay, I'll send you a cash flow board game. That sounds that. great. Now, my, my son would be very into it particularly. Oh, my, my son is already asking me about like what money is. And I have to explain to him that, you know, the differences between money that's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States and actual you know, tradable and fungible gold, for example. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's, it's interesting trying to explain those concepts yeah. to, to, to small kids, particularly, because it requires you to have a little bit more specificity in how you think, right. for sure. So the game teaches both parents and kids. <laughs> and a lot of people say, well, how come my kid's kicking my butt? Except because they don't have brakes put on yet. 
You know, kids just make mistakes. Parents still have what they were programmed to think. Don't make mistakes. Make sure everything, you know, I mean, they're, they're slower. Kids are faster. And so they learn faster. So I learned, you know, when I was 10, my rich dad started teaching me about entrepreneurship and investing with the game of Monopoly. And, you know, I said, so I'm sitting there, and my poor dad, the academic, is going, what you doing? I said, I played Monopoly. And he says, well, that's a waste of time. You know, go back and study. And so I, he says, well, ask, ask, ask your friend's father, Rich Dad, why are you studying Monopoly? And so I asked Rich Dad, I said, why are we studying Monopoly? He says, because one of the greatest formulas of wealth is found in this game board, idiot. I said, what is it? I'm 10 years old, going like this. Four greenhouses, 1031 tax deferred exchange into a red hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and, guess, and so I'm a kid boy, and my old man, the PhD from Stanford and all this stuff, you know, and he's broke. He's broke. He's broke. And Rich Dad goes from his little dinky little store, and now the property he owns is called the Hyatt Regency on Waikiki Beach. So he followed the four greenhouses, one red hotel. And again, the greatest educator of our times could have been Maria Montessori, who said, what the hand does, the mind remembers. So my rich dad, for my education, he says, you want a real education, kid? I go, of course, of course. So he owned, my, my father called, poor dad called him slums. My rich dad says, I'm a low-income housing provider. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just definitions. He says, go knock on doors and collect rent. I'm like, what? You know, so that's why people, everybody wants to invest in real estate, but they don't want to collect rent or fix the toilet. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So I'm 10-year-old, 10, 10 to 12. I'm, uh, your rent is due. And I heard more bullshit than I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> these, these are grown adults going, hey, kid, beat it. Or, you know, I don't have my money. It's you, it's you sons of a bitch. It's you capitalist. I'm 10 years old. I so said, we can't afford it. And they got a big screen TV in the room. They're watching TV. But they can't pay the rent. And they have kids. What are they teaching their kids? Knocking on doors, asking grown-ups for overdue rent. Fried my brains. I said, I don't want to be like you. So to sort of radically shift topic, you mentioned earlier blockchain. So obviously, Bitcoin is a hot topic now. Yeah. Um, I'm actually... A kind of a fan of Bitcoin. I like the idea of the blockchain. Uh, I own some Bitcoin. I own some Ethereum. I've, I've invested in, in what I think are the most well-established coins because a lot of the speculative ones are just right. purely that, right. speculative. Right. Right. Well, what, what is your take on Bitcoin? you think that there's a future there? Well, the same as you. I, uh, I, it ran from zero to 20 and dropped, right? So I studied... The, actually, zero all the way up to like 60 and now it's down back yeah, to but 20. The, yeah. the, the first top was 20. Yeah, yeah. I retraced. I said, okay... If it, re- if it rebounds, it's got momentum mm-hmm. behind it. It's got something behind it, because I don't know. I, I can barely use my cell phone. You know? I'm yeah. so technically challenged. And so when it hit 6,000, I struck. I got 30 at 6. Then it hit 9. I said, okay, it's going to move. So I bought 30 at 9, and I stopped. So I'm watching. I think today's at 21,000. If it goes back to 11, I get interested again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Buy low, sell high. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if it moves up again, it's got legs. Mm-hmm. It's like Amazon, you know, went down several times. And Apple, and they all go up and down. So that's what entrepreneurs know. But most of these coins won't make it back, as you know. 1,800 right. of them. Yeah, I mean, and I think that that is, as you say, the difference between good debt and bad debt, but also the difference between good asset and a bad asset. I mean, the fact is that once it's received a certain level of market buy-in, then it's not going back down to zero. And that's, that's, what, that's what I see. With the, like people have asked me about Bitcoin, and that's what I've said. I've said, now look at the ones that have enough market buy-in that they're not going back to zero. Is there a network? Right, exactly. And, yeah. and with Bitcoin, it ain't going back to zero. It's not even going to come close to, to going back to zero. Well, my, my rich dad, my, you know, he's a great teacher. No college education. He didn't, he didn't go past the eighth grade. And he said, the problem with bull markets is stupid people look smart. <laughs> and as you know, there's a lot of stupid people right now finding out they're not that smart. So let's talk about the, the economy in one second. I want to ask you about the recession, where you think things are going. First, let's talk about what you need to do if you're a responsible human being. You need life insurance. You could be walking down the street and suddenly we're in Florida, an alligator just attacks you. Well, as that alligator is sinking its jaws into your arm, you're thinking to yourself, ma'am, should listen to Shapiro gone over to Policy Genius. Having life insurance through your job might not be enough. Most people need up to 10 times more coverage to properly provide for their families. 
In an unpredictable economy, life insurance can offer peace of mind that anyone who relies on you financially, child, parent, even a business partner, will have a financial cushion. So if something happens to you, they're taken care of. Policy Genius is an insurance comparison website that makes it easy to compare quotes from top companies like AIG and Prudential in one place to find your lowest price. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. Just head on over to policygenius.com, get personalized quotes in minutes, find the right policy for your needs. The licensed agents at Policy Genius work for you, not the insurance companies. They're on hand through the entire process to help you understand your options so you can make decisions with confidence. Your personal info is private. Policy Genius doesn't sell your details to third parties. They don't add on extra fees. Policy Genius has options that offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid those unnecessary medical exams, which is why since 2014, Policy Genius has helped over 30 million people shop for insurance. They've placed over $150 billion in coverage. Head on over to policygenius.com, get your free life insurance quotes, see how much you could save. Okay, so let's talk about the, the economy and where things stand right now. So obviously, it, it, I think we're already in a recession. You can only measure a recession retrospectively. We keep hearing from people, we're not in a recession because we haven't had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. It's like, well, you're not going to find that out until we actually measure the GDP growth at the end of the second quarter. But the, it seems like the, the policies of the Fed, the policies of, of Joe Biden have, have brought about what I thought was almost the unthinkable. I thought it was pretty much unthinkable that we'd be in recession at this point in time or close to it given the fact that we are coming out in January of 2021 with a working vaccine, with a people getting back to work, with uh, you know an artificially induced economic coma that was now being broken. And how do you blow that? And somehow we seem to have blown it. Where do you think the economy is? Do you think that we're going to see a, a recession, stagflation? Where do you think things are now? Where do you think they're going? Okay, it's going to go up and down. Do you know what I mean? And the question I ask people is, if we go into a depression, how will you do? That's the question. So I set it up since 1971 when I saw Nixon take the dollar off the gold standard and I started getting smarter. So I'd say, I don't trust my government. Like, don't fight the Fed. And I was like, can the, can the Fed print oil? Can it print gold? Can it print water? Can it print food? No. But people go, oh, don't fight the Fed. So the thing I always say is, in a worst case scenario, how will you do? So that's why I own oil wells, not oil stocks. I own cattle for the food. I own gold mines. I own my own company. My company, you know, Rich Dad did better in the downturn than ever before. So it's re not recession proof, but people wake up more and they say, I better get financially educated. And, and, and number six, I never stop studying. You know, it's, it's the most important thing you can do. But that one guy said, it was, I think it was a Russian guy, he says the problem with Americans is we're dysfunctionally optimistic. You know, we live in a don't worry, be happy world. And you know, that's not the real world. So one of the things that you also say is that people in America don't tend to emulate the successful. We don't, we don't spend enough time looking at the successful and figuring out how they did it. We instead sort of try to tear them down. Obviously, that's true. I mean, you can even see that in the difference between how people used to dress back in 1950 and how people dress now. It used to be that if you were homeless, you tried to dress like a millionaire. Now, if you're a millionaire, you try to dress like you're homeless. Right. Uh, and uh, and that's, that seems to be the common pattern. It's the one thing, actually, of all the things about Trump that I liked, the thing I liked best is that he was unapologetically wealthy. I, I love the idea that he was just like, yeah, I have a jet. And yeah, my taste is gauche, but I'm going to coat everything, including the toilet in gold. And, and you know what? Tough. Like the, the being, being rich is better than being poor. I mean, that happens to be just a thing that is true about the world. Being rich is, in fact, better than being poor, which is why you'd like to be rich and you want your kids to be rich and you want your nation to be rich. Um, so what, why do you think it is that so many Americans refuse to emulate the successful and, and instead seem to fall into this fallacy of thinking that it's a matter of the fortunate or the unfortunate, or as they like to put it on the left now, the privilege versus the, versus the underprivilege? Well, again, you said earlier, it depends on the person. You know what I mean? And I recommend to anybody, if you want to find out why America's in trouble, go knocking door to door in a low-rent neighborhood and ask for the rent. You'll hear the American attitude coming out. It's horrifying. The rich are evil, tax the rich, and all this stuff. But the thing that's funny about Trump was his private chance is 727. Mine's a layer 60. <laughs> And his, his jet goes like this, and my jet goes like this, Tag. So his jet's bigger than mine. <laughs> and a capitalist like you and me will go, someday I'll have a 727. That's a capitalist. But a communist will say, screw the rich. They're bastards. They steal from us. So it starts with the attitude of the individual. And that's why, you know, like I'm not the, that's why I created Rich Dad. I said, we have to teach people to be capitalists. 
because our schools are teaching us to be communists. So one, one of the things that, that I found most disturbing in sort of the where, where we are in the world of econ talk and, and people who, who live in sort of the halls of, of free markets is that many of them preach the ideas of free markets, but they don't actually like free markets very much. You see this at the World Economic Forum every, every year, right? You have Klaus Schwab and, and company basically talking about the wonders of free markets and we need free trade and we need free markets. And then at the same exact time, They'll be talking about how we in this room, we should set the rules. We can remake the world. We can, we can change everything. And then when things fail, people tend to blame capitalism. And you saw the same thing in 2007, 2008. You, you have an entire government-sponsored industry of giving out subprime loans to subprime borrowers who obviously are not going to pay them back, backed by the government. And then people take those and they mix them into the economy and they create these credit derivative swaps and mix them with a bunch of other assets that are higher rank. And suddenly there's our A assets when they really should not be A assets. And then it infects the entire economy. And then when things go south, we're told by the media that capitalism has failed as opposed to what really happened here, which is the combination of profit-seeking people and government failed. And profit-seeking people and government is not capitalism. Capitalism is a profit-seeking person without the government. Well, um, you know, I, wanted, I, was, I was raised a Christian. My, my family actually are Buddhists, and they converted. And so I had to go to Sunday school. And so, you know, being Japanese, I'm sitting in a little class. And my little Sunday school teacher's over there. She goes, I was bored stiff, you know. <laughs> I, said, what? I was like seven years old. What am I doing here? I could be swimming or something. And she asked this question, which interested me. She says, why were the three wise men wise? Naturally, I raised my hand. I said, because they were rich. She, and the Christian church, the love of money is the root of all evil. So naturally, she was like this. <laughs> you know I mean? Wash your mouth, hell, you little sinner kid. You want to get rich. She said, well, you asked, why are the three men rich? Why? She says, frankincense, gold, and myrrh. They're rich guys. She goes, shh, shh, shh. I got the love, of, the love of money is the root of all evil, you know, again and again and again. That's the Christians, which is a problem. <laughs> but anyway, I won't go there. <laughs> so she finally says, the reason... The three wise men were wise because they always sought the best teachers. And that's what I say to people that they always consider the source of your information. Consider who's teaching you. I mean, I, and I think I like about YouTube is I listen to the communists also. This guy, Richard Wolf, makes my skin crawl. But, you know what I mean? He's a hardcore communist. Of course, he's a teacher. And, but I listen to both sides. And YouTube now gives us that luxury or that advantage we didn't have before. Before you'd have to go to Harvard to listen to those guys. Now you can sit on YouTube and listen to them. You know, like Jordan Peterson got kicked out of academics because he ran into the Communist Teacher Society. So the beauty of, of YouTube and these new social media has got some faults to it, obviously, but it gives us access. And I listen to all sides, and then I choose. Then I know who I am. And that's when I became political, is because I could see what the left was doing. And I went, oh, my God. So, obviously, as someone who knows President Trump, I have to ask you the obvious question. You think that he's going to run again? I would like to have him run again, because I think he's, a, I mean, I know the man personally. He's a good man. His sons and I are good friends. But I think he would destroy the country. This country's already divided. So earlier you mentioned YouTube and uh, the uh, you know, the ability to watch everything. You have had your own personal experiences with censorship and big yes. tech and big tech coming after you. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Well, that's why I have my, 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 my assistant Sarah's here. You know, she's, you're always on the offense and defense with them. You've got to be careful. You know, the saddest thing, Ben, is we've, lo we've lost our freedom of speech. Then they're going after our guns. But I think the worst thing of all is our sense of humor. You know, if I laugh about something, I'm attacked. Just laughing gets you attacked. You know what I'm saying? There's something very sick and rotten inside this country, or well, the world right now. So when we can't laugh anymore, we're in serious trouble. So in a second, I want to ask you about something you mentioned earlier, which is that obviously you're, you're Japanese. You have a, your family has, has had a history of, of being Samurai. unfairly... Yeah, but the samurai yeah. is is in. I have the family sword. Oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, it's passed on to first son, to first son, to first son, to first son. Oh, wow! 
Well, but your, your history in the United States, obviously your family suffered oppression during World War II. And I want to ask about you know, the fact that we've become such a society focused on past oppression as opposed to what we can do for the future. I'm going to get into that in a second. But first, let's talk about how you recruit the best employees to your company. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to travel this summer. Have you thought about all of the people that make a vacation truly great? You've got the people at the hotel who are helping you out, or like me, my producers, who actually have to travel with me. You know, outstanding talent, it's crucial for a successful business. And if you're hiring, you can find talent for roles like those and much more over at ZipRecruiter. When you try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Ben Guest. ZipRecruiter uses its powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. You can easily review these recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply. Additionally, ZipRecruiter has a complete suite of tools that makes it easy to filter, review, and rate your candidates. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter will get a quality candidate within day one. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site based on G2 satisfaction ratings as of January 1st, 2022. So travel to this easy to remember web destination, ziprecruiter.com slash Ben Guest. That's where you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Again, that's ziprecruiter.com slash B-E-N-G-U-E-S-T. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. We hear at The Daily Wire, we've been using the ZipRecruiter for years. That's how we got all of our great employees and how we replaced our not so great ones. Go check them out right now at ziprecruiter.com slash Ben Guest. That's ziprecruiter.com slash Ben Guest. Okay, so you mentioned earlier briefly that uh, your your family history is that they're actual they were actually interned during World War II in a concentration camp. Their property was was taken away, and uh, and yet you didn't end up bitter at the United States. You're very positive about the United States. What do you think has changed? Because this seems to be a, a real generational difference. It seemed like for a while there we were on the right track, where people realized that America's past you know had a lot of horrific things about it, but that we were moving in the right direction. There was a lot of freedom for individuals, and now it seems like we're moving directly in the opposite direction. How did you get past that as, a, as an individual? Well, that's a great question. First of all, education is more important. You might be a doctor, lawyer, you know, accountant. School's important. But it's what we're teaching kids now is to be victims. It's a victim mentality. That's where Black Lives Matter, called critical race theory, and all the other garbage are pumping out. You're victims. You must get even. So in my family, had everything taken away. They were locked up in Manzanar and all this other stuff. It inspired us to fight more. So during World War II, they formed the 442nd All Japanese American Infantry Battalion. It is today the single most highly decorated infantry battalion in U.S. Army history. And I had three uncles serving that in the uh, European campaign, and two uncles fought against the Japanese, and one was captured. And uh, he was, ca you know, so a Japanese captured another Japanese guy. He's not welcome home, brother. And so I asked, why, why was my uncle was captured by the Japanese so bitter? And he wasn't bitter. He was tracking down the, the prisoner of war. It was like Hogan's heroes, you know, like he was after the guy. And so I said, why? He says, because he was Japanese fighting for the Americans. He publicly castrated him. I said, I'd be a little bit bitter on that one, too. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so he never had kids. He was married, happily married, and all this stuff. But we fought harder for our country. That's the difference. And our schools are teaching kids to be victims. It's a horrible, horrible thing we're teaching kids. So, you know, in, in my own career, uh, I can see that you know, every failure leads to a lesson that you can then apply forward. And so, you know, before we started Daily Wire, Jeremy Boring, my business partner and I, uh, we, we had worked together on a couple of failed enterprises. He had, he had run a company called Declaration Entertainment, which was basically the idea that we were going to make conservative movies, but crowdfunded, didn't do well. We started, a, we started working with David Horowitz Freedom Center and founded Truth Revolt, and that started going well, and then it sort of fell apart. Uh, and then we started Daily Wire, and it was we, we had learned a lot of lessons over the course of the prior years, and, and that really led to our success. What were some of the most important failures to you uh, that, that allowed you to kind of... Well, I, I think you get into how do, we, how do we learn. Humans learn by making mistakes. You know, God designed us. So when a baby learns to walk, baby crawls, stands up and falls, stands up and falls, then finally takes the first step, and the next thing, running, then flying. But what our schools do, when a child falls, they punish them. You're stupid. You make mistakes. Smart people don't make mistakes. And when, the way, when I look at the way humans are designed to learn, we're designed to learn from mistakes. So that's why you can't, you know, you play golf. I'm sure Tiger Woods has hit more bad shots than me. <laughs> He's failed more than me. 
So when you look at the real reality of the world, the biggest failures are the most successful. You know, like, what's his name? Uh, Steve Jobs never went to, you know, he dropped out of, I don't know, uh, Reed College. Gates dropped out of Harvard. Michael Dell at the University of Texas. But they failed their way to success. But our academics say, that's greedy. They're capitalists. Don't make mistakes and do as I tell you. Do as I tell you. And don't question anything I say. That's called tyranny. So in your own life, what do you think were some of the, the failures that have been most informative to you? The biggest, I crashed three times in Vietnam. And you know how I crashed three times and lived? Because the Marine Corps, I was flying right next to the top gun school in San Diego. And we had to, we had to crash three times a day. Every single day, you know, because we knew that in 1972, when I was going to get in, going over to Vietnam, life expectancy of a gunship pilot was 30 days. So the lesson the Marine Corps taught us, the more dangerous the mission, the more you have to prepare. So every day we had to log in how many you know, auto rotations we shot. So every day we'd kill our engines and we learned to fly without engines. So I got to Vietnam, went down three times. It was like practice. So the lesson I learned from the Marine Corps was the more dangerous the mission, you must prepare. So when you look at other countries around the world, uh, where do you think the United States places in terms of sort of our international economic readiness? I mean, the, the, the bet that a lot of people are making right now is that the United States is still the strongest weak horse, meaning that you know, there are a lot of other countries out there. The United States still is, is one of the freest. Uh, we, uh, unlike a lot of the European countries, our demographics are not quite as in market decline. Uh, we still have, you know, we're, we're reproducing at less than replacement rates, but it's not like, say, Japan, which is now reproducing at like 0.8 or 0.9. Uh, and uh, and you know, as long as we're the strongest horse, then people are still going to buy up our debt. People are still going to finance the dollar. People are still going to get into bonds. And, you know, I, I wonder how long that's going to last or where you think that the, any other nations that you think are, are sort of biting at our heels? Well, the first most important thing about America is freedom. See, you can be a capitalist, you can be a communist. I have a lot of friends who are communists, but they don't know it. They, they never read the Communist Manifesto, so thank you. Or you can be Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Muslim. That's probably our greatest asset is that freedom. And even when I come here, you have to have guards around your building, but at least you can have a guard and arms. And I'm armed to the teeth all the time. So don't take my guns away, is what I'm <laughs> saying. You know what I mean? So that gives us our strength. But we have to fight back. That's all I'm saying. So I don't the book Capitalist Manifesto to counter a Communist Manifesto. Because people haven't read Communist Manifesto, so I wrote Capitalist Manifesto. You know, I just want to fight back. And I think the freedom to fight back is essential. And this next coming election, uh, you and I are very optimistic that it's going to be a trouncing of the worst president we've ever seen, Biden. And I'm not political. I just think he's the most incompetent. He and I are the same age, but I still have some brain cells left, you know. But I can't believe he opens the border and lets all that fentanyl through. I can't believe he cuts down the XL, the Keystone XL pipeline, and then blames Russia for raising gas prices. And Americans believe the idiot. I mean, I'm not saying don't listen to what he says. Watch what he's doing. He opens the borders. He cuts down our oil supply. Uh, they, he calls parents terrorists for questioning the school system. And then he blames Putin for our problems. Okay. That's a weak president. I would say that the good news about him is that he's creating a really massive backlash. And yes. that, that's, that's made me uh, very that's optimistic. It. because That's the best news ever. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of us were very depressed in November uh, of 2020. And, and the fact that, again, I, if you go back and you listen to my podcast, I was saying that, that Biden was going to have a real easy time of it because by all extraneous circumstance, he should have had an easy time of it. We weren't in the middle of any serious foreign wars. We, we had an economy that was going to naturally rebound because it had been booming before COVID. And now COVID was going to come to an end. And somehow he blew it so badly that he's going to usher in the people he hates most back into office, I think. That, that seems the direction the country is moving. I agree 100% with you. I think the Republican Party should pay him to campaign harder. <laughs> <laughs> because the more he opens his mouth, the more votes come to the Republican Party. <laughs> he's, he's the best advertiser the conservatives have. <laughs> so I want to ask you a few final questions, starting with 
why you think that so many Americans are just completely ignorant of capitalism and, and what you think the main fundamental things about capitalism people should know are. But if you'd like to hear Robert Kiyosaki's answers, you have to be a Daily Wire member. Head on over to dailywire.com slash Sunday. You can click that link in the episode description. Use code Ben for 25% off. You can hear the rest of our conversation over there. Well, folks, that is Robert Kiyosaki. Robert, thank you so much for stopping by. It really is a pleasure. Don't forget, everyone, make sure to go out and get a copy of Robert Kiyosaki's new book, Capitalist Manifesto, How Entrepreneurs Can Save Capitalism. Don't forget to check out his YouTube page, The Rich Dad Channel. Robert, thanks so much for joining the show. It's great Thank to have you. you here. Congratulations. How did a young guy like you get so smart so fast? That's why I keep asking. That's very nice of you. <laughs> The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special is produced by Mathis Glover. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Production manager, Brandon McGuire. Associate producer, Savannah Dominguez-Morris. Editing is by Jim Nichol. Camera and lighting is by Zach Genta. Audio is mixed by Mike Carmina. Hair, makeup, and wardrobe is by Fabiola Cristina. Title graphics are by Cynthia Angulo. Production coordinator, Jessica Kranz. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022.